Good afternoon. If everyone, will, if I could have your attention, please. Just so that you know, you are in the Appropriations for Healthcare meeting, and we're looking forward to hearing from everyone today. We have quite a few people that want to speak. I'm going to ask that you be brief and succinct. Uh, we want to hear everyone, and we want to have everyone have their opportunity to speak. Uh, before we begin, I would, could Chairman Newton, would you give us a blessing? What number? Okay. Sorry, thank you. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to serve uh, one another in this state, the, uh, the honor to be here, but really the honor to serve you. We need your guidance and your wisdom as we make decisions for this state, and we ask for that right now. Thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Um, if you have not signed in, we need you to have signed up on the list. I have a list here, and we will go down that list. Uh, Claire Russell, if you would come up to the podium. If you will introduce yourself and tell us who you are representing. I'm Claire Russell, and I represent the Association of Community Care Providers, which is um, provides home and community-based services. Um, you have a packet that has been given to you, but Dave Lamb is going to go over that um, in more detail than I am. I just want you to know that you have it in front of you. Um, I would like to introduce to this panel um, Tom Bauer with Leading Age, who is in support of our ask. Nancy Petra from the Alzheimer's Association, who is in support of our ask, and Dave Lamb with Home Care um, Association of America. So we have come together as a group of like-minded people who do like-minded things um, to ask for help for um, vulnerable Georgians. I, I want you to know that I'm a registered nurse, graduated from the Medical College of Georgia many years ago, and I want you to know that I take care of your parents, I take care of your grandparents, I go in their homes and see what they need, I talk to many of the children, um, and they uh, rely on me, they rely on my company to ask about what's the best course of action to take. One in nine American, one in nine right now have Alzheimer's or dementia. That's a problem. Um, and ergo, we have the um, support of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, we're facing, as everybody is in the nation, recruitment um, and hiring um, positions, and that leads us to have to um, take care of people with using overtime. What I want to share with you is this. Our reimbursement rate is $19 an hour for care that's two and a half hours and greater. $19. You know and I know that Walmart, McDonald's, Sprint, Amazon are paying $15 to $20 an hour. Those positions do not lead them to change diapers or do personal care or do some of the unpleasantries that are, we ask and teach and require of our aides. So it's a pretty good skill and it takes someone with a calling to to be part in this pr profession. So what I want you to know is for the price of $19, we're paying the aides. Generally, you can guess we're paying overtime many of the times because we cannot leave someone in the bed unattended. But for that $19, we're required by law to pay drive time to one client to another client. That is not reimbursed by the state. That comes off that $19. We're required to provide workman's comp. That comes off that $19. We're required to provide a registered nurse to go in and supervise the care on a regular and routine basis. That comes out of the $19. Um, CPR, training, first aid, that comes out of the $19. Um, it didn't take, you don't even have to do any math to figure out why I'm standing up here. Um, 
I'm up here to ask you to let me continue um, my 30-something odd year career and help me continue to take care of your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, and those and your neighbors. And with that, I will turn this over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I'm going to talk from these notes. Madam Chair, committee members, uh, we do. We go into thousands of homes every day, enabling folks to stay in their home, as, as Claire mentioned, or stay in their communities. And that's where they want to be. Wanted to share with you, you've got a summary of our ask. We are asking for a 10% rate increase in state funds been working with Tara, but that number more than likely will be between 27 and 29 million dollars. But if you'll flip to the third page, you'll see that our elderly population, we're already at 1.8 million. We're talking about the elderly and disabled waiver. Uh, the elderly and disabled total in Georgia is approaching 2.8 or 2.7 million, one in four Georgians. So it, it's, uh, it's a population that needs a lot of, of our attention. The next page is a survey. We have surveyed, and I've got the, the actual rates there for what we do by the hour if we're in the home. Now that does not include adult day health, that does not include case management, that does not include a lot of other work that's done but our weighted average ends up being slightly over $20 an hour. Our respondents for Medicaid typically are trying to pay pay rates in the average of $13.50. That's very difficult. In their non-Medicaid, they're paying 15 and more, but that non-Medicaid is private pay. And private pay rates in the state of Georgia range between 26 and $32 an hour, depending on geography. Our overtime, roughly a third are working overtime 5 to 10% of hours, and another third are 10 to 20% of straight time hours. So th those numbers are very difficult. If you go back to 2000, and in 2000, Georgia eclipsed a million seniors. And then look at what has happened up to this point rate-wise, comparing it to the cost of living. Our PSS, personal support service rates, are behind over $11 an hour. Now, the General Assembly has been very generous to us and has helped us, but we continue to fall behind because of the factors that Claire referenced. There is a benchmarking study that is done nationwide on private home care providers. If you look at that just for Georgia, and then look at that for, for providers, the current blended rate, the pay rate to be profitable is $11 an hour. To support $15 an hour, it takes $27 an hour average rate. 85% of providers are declining folks uh, that need care, and that can't happen. And then last week, Walmart announced that they are ra they're raising their average wage, which means starting at Walmart will go from $12 an hour to $14 an hour with the March 2nd pay period. So. You can see there's a list there that uh, shows what we can't do when folks don't show up. We've got to be able to pay our caregivers. These four groups that are working together are kind of just the tip of the iceberg. Our elderly, our elderly and disabled folks in Georgia need care. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. The next on our list will be Denise Cornegay. Thank you and good afternoon. You should have a handout for me that looks like this with the statewide AHEC on the top. 
Some of you will have an additional handout, which is what we call the matrix, because I forgot to staple it on the first ones. So if you have that, it's just because it was included in the other ones. I'd like to talk to you about workforce. Um, as hopefully most of you know, we are the state's health workforce pipeline program. We are academically neutral, although I am based out of the Medical College of Georgia, Augusta University. We work with every healthcare profession program in the state, public and private. And so we are really looking at communities and trying to work with those communities to meet their local health workforce needs, and it's a challenge. We have come up with some ideas and some requests that reflect our work and our experience. The first is um, actually not a huge budget issue because it already exists, but we're looking to reauthorize our preceptor tax incentive program. And of course, that is a loss to collected revenues. I'm very pleased that uh, Chairman Newton is going to be carrying our bill and several other of you all have signed on already and it's been dropped this afternoon. So we'll have a bill number tomorrow. But just to support that bill, to explain this packet to you, the first page front and back are our ask. The other pages support each of those asks. So if you have detailed questions or if you want to see a map of where people are getting these benefits and things, those are attached. So the first page is what you're really needing to follow with me. The second thing is we are really looking at recruitment. And for all the fancy things we can say, what you put into a program is what you get out. And so if we want people to serve in rural and minority communities, we have to recruit from rural and minority communities. We have to make those, um, those students competitive in the higher education pipeline. We know this, and we know we need to do a better job of it. So we really look at, in the AHEC, we do a lot of classroom presentations all around the state, and there's numbers in there for you to see, but that's casting a seed. And what we need is more and more intensive programs. And these are programs that are 20 hours or more. Based on the data that we've been able to collect over 30 years, we know that somewhere around 68 to 78 percent of the students who come through an intensive AHEC program actually matriculate into a health profession program in Georgia. So we know we need to give them that opportunity. It also helps to get them more ready for college. <clears throat> so we're asking for funds for the programs, but also for more staff. Right now we have one person at each of our six centers who does health careers. They are generally entry-level people right out of college, you know, young, exciting, energetic. We need seasoned people to do some more of these intensive programs because they need to be able to work with academic programs. And it, it's hard for someone right out of college to have the presence and the ability to communicate effectively with the snobs in academia. Okay, so um, one of the things we have is called Pathways to Medicine. We have it in Southwest Georgia and in Northeast Georgia. It is highly successful. It works at identifying rural college kids getting them exposed to all five medical schools in the state, now six, I guess, um, and helping them to be competitive. It's a four-week residential program. We're at like 92% success rate of those students finishing pathways and getting accepted into a medical school, which is phenomenal. We want to expand that. We also want to take that very successful model and create a pathways to mental health. We want a pathways to dentistry and a pathways to nursing. Same model, trying to get these students and get them in, make sure they know what they're doing, and get them into our workforce, because we are desperate, as you all know. The next thing on my list is housing. And all of you, I promise you when I was a little girl, I never grew up wanting to be a property manager, but there you go. Um, right now, we have about 321 beds in the state in apartments all over Georgia. There's a map of where that housing is located. This housing is incredibly important. For health profession students, you have to do what's called clerkships or rotations. They are usually four to six weeks in length. So you, and they're remote from your campus. Well, the students don't want to go off their campus if they have to find an apartment and pay for it somewhere else in the state. So it's a huge barrier. So providing that housing has become one of the major roles we play. Well, this past year, we had um, a 23% increase in the cost of our existing housing. And this is all COVID related in my mind. People just went nuts. And so we came to y'all and, and you have in the amended budget put in the 184,000 we asked for to be whole for this year for our existing housing. 
but we want more housing because every program in the state is coming to you asking to expand its class size. Well, half that education occurs in a classroom and the other half has to occur in the community. And we've got to have more resources out there. So that is the housing request. The next one is a, a new idea. We know that across the state, across the country, everybody has invested in a lot of funds to do resiliency training for healthcare providers. And that's important. Wellness and resiliency is important. We want to take a different lens on this. We want to create resources for employers to create healthier workplaces that don't require so much resilience to thrive. So we're asking for some small funds actually to do that. We're thinking we can do that statewide out of the program office and provide those resources through one source instead of having to replicate that. The final thing that's on our ask is a totally new idea. It came out of focus groups that we have done with employers and with nurses, new graduates, nursing students, um, and a host of other folks. And what they told us is that our nursing students are graduating without sufficient clinical skills. And they entered, the nurses told us, you know, when you go into a workforce, you feel inadequate. And so you get your training, you get precepted at that, that hospital, but you leave as soon as possible because everybody knows that you didn't know what you were doing and it's embarrassing. And that, that's one of the reasons for the high turnover of new nurses. So we were thinking that what we could do, we already have simulation centers that have been funded across the state and they have lots of equipment and that we could create partnerships in three regions as a pilot with the local educational programs and create a four week boot camp for new nurse graduates to focus nothing on nothing but clinical skills and patient management. And in the little fact sheet that goes with that, it gives you the specific things that we would look at teaching them. So these are our requests, um, and we hope that you can help us to meet these workforce challenges. Thank you very much. Next on the list is Andy Lord. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Andy Lord. I represent the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia. I am also a sickle cell trait holder, which is uh, uncommon. Um, Madam Chair, I also want to thank you for hosting this committee today. It is Sickle Cell Lobby Day at the Capitol, and I hope that uh, for any members of this committee that haven't had a chance to meet some of your constituents, if you see someone in red, there's a good chance they are here for Sickle Cell Lobby Day, so um, we're happy that that uh, coincided. I want to start by thanking this committee, which has um, in previous years been very supportive of the Sickle Cell Foundation and we want to render our appreciation and sincere gratitude for that. Um, we have a an operations report that I will be delivering to each of you all that enumerates um, and accounts for all of the appropriations that you all have already rendered um, to the foundation. <clears throat> I will bring, be bringing that by um, all of your offices. I wanted to present to you all today our budget request for the upcoming uh, year. Um, and I wanna underscore two things about these recommendations. Number one is these um, recommendations build on um, what this committee has already approved and sanctioned in terms of how we go about doing our work across the state. We wanted to build on that because we've already gotten buy-in from you on that. And uh, secondarily, uh, some of the recommendations in this committee come from a sickle cell study committee that the Senate hosted last year that brought some new things to light. So what you'll see reflected in here are the recommendations from those committees and also from the, the, the work previously sanctioned by this group. So to walk through this real quickly, um, we subdivided our total budget into a couple of sections that I wanted to run through real quickly. First on this, um, request is an increase in pay for CHWs um, that we employ. Um, what we have found is that our CHW pay is quite low. And what that means is we often um, uh, employ CHWs 
at an entry level and at an entry level of pay. We train them. They become further embedded in the uh, community. They gain experience. And then private employers or insurance companies come in and offer them a higher rate and kind of scoop them up. And we have to uh, start all over again. So what we would like to do is try to make CHW pay on our level more competitive uh, so that we don't um, have kind of the turnstiles um, going with regard to <clears throat> our CHWs across the state. Um, the second area where we are asking for enhanced funding on is uh, support for community-based organizations around the state. We currently work in partnership with existing health entities in Savannah, Hinesville, Columbus, Covington, Augusta, Hampton, and Atlanta. That's where we currently are. Um, we, we do want to extend um, the uh, geographies that we are not in, but we also want to increase our support for these CBOs. They are already on the ground. Um, they're already working uh, with a population that um, is directly ours or overlaps with ours. Um, so we want to increase those budgets for those community groups. Um, we also have um, what we call a, what we now call a health hub. This was what we previously described as our mobile testing unit. So. Uh, through the generosity of this committee, we were funded with a um, basically a mobile RV unit that we have converted to be a testing lab, an education lab, etc. We uh, take this bus um, or this RV around the state and provide screenings, education, trainings, etc. throughout the state. And to date, we have screened over a hundred thousand Georgians uh, for sickle. Uh, sell um, um, and have had over uh, 13,000 um, positive tests there. Um, this, this unit also incorporates a hematologist. So we put a hematologist on this mobile unit and it goes to, I mentioned before those uh, brick and mortar areas where we're located and have partnerships. The purpose of this mobile unit is to go into the areas that don't have brick and mortar care. And the criteria we use for where we send this mobile unit is that it has to be 100 miles or more away. Um, from existing hematologist care. So we are really trying to take the health care system to these populations that are so far away from um, health care access otherwise, particularly with sickle cell. And if you know anything about sickle cell, if you go into a crisis, it's very painful um, and can escalate very quickly. And driving 100 miles just is, is not an option if you're um, having a sickle cell event. And lastly, Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, uh, we have uh, asked for an increase in appropriations to fund our wellness center. Um, the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia was founded in 1971. We've been on Benjamin, East Park, Benjamin E. Mays Parkway, about 20 minutes from where we're sitting right now, since 1971. That building has now earned a federal historic district um, designation, but we only had half of the building. Um, we have now expanded, in part with support from this committee in this state, um, to the whole building. And we have found that very necessary because as the hospital closures have continued throughout Georgia and more specifically um, with a Wellstar closing, we have seen a huge uptick in need. Um, and people who are getting care directly related to sickle cell or even indirectly related to sickle cell, we have seen a huge surge in need. So we have expanded our offices to account for that need, um, but that need is also um, creating a lot of pressure um, on our current budget. Um, so. Um, uh, that is um, uh, the framework of the budget. We want to better engage and retain uh, CHWs. We want to deliver more money to the community through the CBOs. We want to take hematology care on our mobile unit to the areas of the state that just don't have access to care. And we want to take care of this prolific increase that we're seeing here in Atlanta as a result of the Wellstar closure. Um, so we, again, appreciate the support this community has already rendered and uh, look forward to working with you all on this budget going forward. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Next, Laura Basie. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee. I'm Laura Bracey with the American Heart Association. 
Um, the Heart Association fully supports and advocates for the coverage of blood pressure monitors and cuffs for Medicaid recipients, which has already been included in the governor's um, fiscal year 24 budget. More than one in three Georgians have been told that they have high blood pressure, which is a major risk factor for both heart disease and stroke, the number one and number three killers of Georgians. Self-monitored blood pressure, which is when patients regularly measure and track blood pressure at home in coordination with care, has been proven to help people manage their blood pressure and stay with treatment protocols. Um, just recently, actually yesterday, there was a report that said um, that pregnant women should have their blood pressure monitored more reg regularly because high blood pressure in pregnant women has doubled in the last 30 years. So I just wanted to, to share our support of um, self-monitored blood pressure and cuffs and the inclusion of that in the governor's budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next would be uh, Rick Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I, my name is Rick Ward. I'm with the Executive Director of the Georgia Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We represent uh, 1,800 pediatricians in the state of Georgia and pediatric subspecialists like cardiologists, pediatric ophthalmologists, uh, you name it. There's almost a pediatric specialist for every adult medicine specialty. Although someone reminded me there aren't pediatric geriatricians. That's one that we don't cover. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, but I'm here speaking on behalf of the Coalition of Primary Care Medical Associations, which include the Georgia Academy of Family Physicians, the, uh, the chapter of the AAP, of course, the uh, Georgia OBGYN Society, the Georgia Osteopathic Medical Society, and the Georgia College of Physicians, which is the internal medicine group. Uh, those four specialties, family medicine, internal medicine, OBGYN, and pediatrics, comprise 11,000 physicians in the state and uh, provide the bulk of medical care to every one of our citizens, no matter what their insurance status. We've come before this committee periodically over the last several years to try to improve Medicaid payment rates closer to the level of Medicare payment rates and this committee has been uh, very supportive of this and we're appreciative of that. And I think one of the reasons that you've done that is because we have made the connection that having physicians in communities is a basic part of infrastructure to keep that uh, community not just healthy physically but healthy economically. Companies aren't going to relocate or expend plants when a physician uh, can't make it in their community because of their heavy Medicaid caseload. Uh, for example, in pediatrics, it's not uncommon in parts of rural Georgia where 70% of the pediatrician's uh, patients might be on Medicaid or peach care. Um, so if Medicaid pays well below even basic Medicare, it's tough for that physician to stay viable. And I guess the other thing that we point out, and I think the General Assembly appreciated, is that when, when a physician practice closes, they might have been uh, covering 70% Medicaid, but the whole community loses. Uh, Medicaid cannot be separated from the overall health care infrastructure that we want to have uh, for a sound Georgia. Um, so we're working with, um, uh, in terms of a proposal like we have over the last several years intermittently, um, to go ahead and get, seek uh, Medicaid reimbursement increases for a handful of doctor services that are currently being paid well below Medicare. And we look forward to bringing that to you. Uh, just as a reminder, Medicare physician schedule is set by the federal government because they pay for 100% of it. Medicaid physician rates and hospital rates and everybody else, because the state participates to about a third, uh, you set those rates. So um, we appreciate what you've done in the past and we look forward to uh, working with you in the future and bringing you a proposal to consider. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Our next speaker will be Callan Wells. Kaylin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. We're going to make things really fast, and Polly's going to come up here with me so we can speed through your list for you. Um, my name is Callan Wells. I'm with GEARS, the Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students. 
Um, you all heard about us yesterday from Representative Dempsey on the floor. We brought babies to the Capitol um, with their parents to advocate for um, affordable child care, access to paid leave, as well as access to health care services. And I'm here today to talk to you about access to health care services for young children and their parents. Um, we are in support of a pilot that the Department of Public Health um, is interested in starting um, for home visiting. Uh, this is a ro more robust model of home visiting that would bring additional um, services to families in rural areas. We know that in our rural counties we have roughly 60 counties with no pediatrician and with no OBGYN. Um, so this would be bringing services directly to families' homes to supplement um, their visits to the pediatrician or to the OBGYN. Um, some of the counties that would be um, in this home visiting pilot would be up in Northeast Georgia, Stevens, Banks, Habersham, Franklin, and then um, in Southeast Georgia, kind of from Bullock to Clinch County. So we know that these are counties with really limited access to health care, um, and home visiting would bring those services again directly to the home and help supplement um, their visits to the pediatrician and to the OBGYN, not replace them, but work with them, um, especially for high-risk pregnancies, um, to really support moms and babies who are at risk um, in those areas. Um, in addition to supporting our families here in Georgia, this would help us to bring down additional federal dollars through um, the new Jackie Walerski Maternal and Child Home Visiting Reauthorization Act that was passed this year. A bipartisan group of Georgia um, representatives actually co-sponsored this bill. So this is um, bipartisan from the feds and um, additional funding would help us bring down federal dollars. So the pilot we're estimating is about two million, which would be about 80,000 per county. Um, yes, so I'm gonna let Polly jump in too. Yeah, we're, we're big fans of home visiting and we feel like this is this time has come. Um, and in addition to the you know 70,000 or so per county, that this would help get these programs like to be robust to Callan's point, but also, I think as we talk in the State House uh, lately about uh, the hoteling of children and foster care of the high needs children, this is the ultimate starting point for prevention because these programs have eyes on the family, on the children, and are able to better serve those kids before it becomes a total crisis state. Um, so I just wanted to put that in, in our ask. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Oh, I, I did have one more thing, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. Um, another, one thing that, that Voices has been looking at is the unified formulary. Um, and I know that uh, the Office of Health Strategy and Coordination did a report on the unified formulary for drugs for behavioral health. Mm -hmm. And we would um, respectfully ask that the state consider doing a similar report for uh, other drugs, especially drugs affecting children um, that could be really helpful in terms of asthma and diabetes control. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there. So Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Our next presenter would be Polly McKenna. Oh, you came up. Oh, yes, I saw you there. So you came up together. Thank you. Um, Darren Tolliver. Hello, dear Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for holding this important hearing. My name is Darren Tolliver, and I'm a director of a Beata Home Health Care Office here in Atlanta that provides care through the Georgia Pediatric Program, also known as GAP. I'm here to testify in support of increasing funding for the Medicaid reimbursement rates under the Georgia Pediatric Program by at least 12% at an estimated state cost of about $2 million. Medicaid GAP provides in-home nursing care to more than 1,700 medically fragile children across the state. These children require significant nursing intervention, many requiring tracheostomies to maintain their airways, mechanical ventilators, 
and gastronomy tubes to receive medicine and nutrition. I want to thank this committee for the work you've done in recent years to address the access to care challenges we are experiencing, not just in GAP and the GAP program, but across all home and community-based services. And I'm here to tell you that your continued support this session is absolutely critical. According to the Department of Community Health's Utilization and Expenditure Report for the first half of this state's fiscal year, Overall spending for nursing services under GAP continues to decline despite an increase to the reimbursement rates last session. While we'd expect to see an increase in spending, this continued decline supports what we are experiencing at the provider level, where we continue to struggle to recruit nurses. Without enough nurses, we cannot accept referrals and cover all hours that GAP recipients are authorized to receive. Throughout 2022, Bayada reported a 47% increase in unfilled hours due to an inability to recruit nurses, and we declined nearly 90% of our Medicaid referrals. This means children are foregoing the care they've been authorized to receive, putting them at preventable risk of hospitalization, and forcing family members to scramble to fill in these gaps in care often causing them to miss work, if not forcing them from the workforce entirely. I have several families that are going through this. They've either been uh, terminated, the parents of the children have been terminated, or they're under reprimand because of the nursing instability, and it's very stressful to them. Investing in the gap nursing reimbursement rates is what's best for the health of these vulnerable children and their families, and it's also what's best for the state. It costs less than $600 per recipient per week to provide in-home nursing care, compared to the tens of thousands of dollars it costs to care for that same child in a hospitalized setting. Thank you for your support last session, as it was absolutely critical first step in addressing this intensifying workforce crisis. I ask that you continue this urgent work this session so that GAP providers can continue to increase nurses' wages and recruit the workforce necessary to meet the needs of our state's most vulnerable, our medically fragile children. On behalf of Beata, Hearts from Home Care, and a coalition of five GAP providers, we recommend increasing the Medicaid nursing reimbursement rates under GAP by at least 12%, as state costs about $2 million. Thank you for your time. Uh, what questions do you have? We don't have any questions, but I appreciate very much your presenting with us today. Thank you so much for Thank having you. me. Thank you. Our next will be uh, Jim Matney. Madam Chair, distinguished members, uh, I'm Jim Matney. I'm the CEO at Cockett Regional Medical Center. <clears throat> As you've heard time and time again, workforce is the single biggest issue that prohibits access to care. Uh, years ago, and we've got a presentation here, but I want you to look at the first slide there because I want to give you some history. Years ago, we had similar problems. We had problems f trying to find nursing staff. We had problems finding physicians. Uh, we had limited services. We came to this legislative body and they gave us $250,000. And we took that $250,000 and grew it. Uh, we now currently have 1,500 employees and we do over 33,000 ER visits a year. How did we increase our workforce? I'm on the next slide over here. Gradual got meta education. We were a small rural hospital Average day census is about 50, and we decided to open up a family medicine program. We have now graduated six classes of family medicine docs that we've actually put out into the community. A couple, three years ago, we came to this legislative body and said, hey, we need some help starting psychiatry, because now that we've got family medicine docs, a lot of these people have mental health issues. So we started a psychiatry program, believe it or not, and when, they, when we started thinking about it, we didn't even have psychiatry in our hospital. But we knew that was a need that we had to have. So we opened up a 10-bed psychiatric unit and started our first class, and now we're getting ready to seat our second class of psychiatrist in a rural setting. Most of these psychiatrists are gonna be trained for outpatient type psychiatry, so they're gonna go out. Now we're a 47,000 population ca county. We can't, uh, 
employ all those psychiatrists. Our vision is that those psychiatrists will get used to, to working down in South Georgia and actually go out and take care of folks in that region. I used to say to people, just because you're in the rural areas doesn't mean you should have limited access to care. Doesn't mean that your kids should have to go uh, north of Macon to get educated. We actually recruited Philadelphia College of Ospec Medicine to come into our town and they opened up a four-year medical school right there in Motry. The reason Motry is important is because if you know where it is, we sit in the middle. It's like a star and we've got Tifton, we've got Albany, we've got Valdosta, and we've got Thomasville. And we sit there and we draw with all those places. But then again, all those people try to steal our nurses too and try to steal our working staff. So rather than sitting there just closing beds like a lot of people have done, we decided we need to increase our efforts to educate our youth. Uh, Family Medicine Boards, 100% passage of their medical boards. They're all medical doctors now because of our residency program. We talked about our psychiatry. One of the other things we decided to do was to work with the local high school. I'm older. I remember when LPNs used to be able to go to high school and graduate when they got out of high school as an LPN. We actually went to our high school and started a new program. We've got 23 10th graders that are going to go into the 11th grade this year and start their licensed practical nurse. And when they graduate from high school, they're actually going to graduate as an LPN and go on, hopefully, to go on to, be, uh, to get their associate degree or their bachelor's degree in nursing. So I always say, if we've got a problem, we've got, we've got to find the solution. Well, one of the things that we're asking for is funding to help with the education building for all those programs. I'm all over the world on this thing here, but as you can see, we've got simulation labs in there. We've got classrooms in there. But what we need, let me go to my ask because, uh, and we've got some beautiful pictures in there, but I'll go to the last page, is technology. It's not cheap, and as quick as you buy it, it's a little outdated. We're asking for $714,000 for some technology for our simulation labs. The other thing is, is, is collaboration. We actually are asking for 653000 for a Da Vinci robot assisted system to train. A system that allows another doctor to, to get on the other side of the robot and actually control the ro robot and train them. We uh, met with Emory uh, Surgery Residencies, and this year the, their fourth year residents are actually going to be coming to Cockpit Regional and training for a whole year. One of the things we learned is that when you no insult to any of my colleagues in here, but lots of times when you're training at an Emory or a bigger university, you don't learn how to do the gallbladders, you don't learn how to do the appendix, you learn how to do the big heavy stuff. So coming down to Motry, they get the appendix, they get the gallbladders, they get all those things. So those residents are going to be coming down to our hospital and actually train with our surgeons. Our hope is that some of them, and it's an elective basis, some of them will actually want to come and work in rural Georgia because it's an elective thing and they get to come. So we're doing everything we can to come up with solutions to educate our workforce, to educate our nurses, to educate our doctors so that people in South Georgia can actually have the health care. I always tell this one story about my chief nursing officer. Her father had a heart attack and had to travel 80 miles to get care, and he died. That was 11 years ago, and I always say, people in, in rural Georgia should have access to the same health care as, as uh, downtown Atlanta does. Don't have anything wrong with my brother in Atlanta, but I'm really wanting to make sure that we increase the access to health care through nurses, through doctors, through technicians, all that in rural Georgia, and that's my ask. And if you give it to us like we've done in the past, I promise you we'll come back and tell you what we've done with your money. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that a lot. Okay, our next presenters are uh, Dr. Palmer and Dr. Santos. If you'd come to the microphone. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and representatives of the committee. Um, I'm Chris Palmer, I'm an internal medicine physician by trade, and I'm 
here with my colleague, Dr. Santos, who will speak for a minute or two after I'm done. But we're here talking about Archibald Medical Center and the internal medicine residency that we started as of this past summer. You know, just as Dr. Or Mr. Matney, you know, kind of alluded to, you know, Southern Georgia, you know, is in critical need of physicians. You know, we have a, a wide gap of, of patients that don't have primary care physicians. And, you know, by educating physicians locally, we hope to retain them and keep them in, you know, whether it be Southern Georgia, but Georgia as a whole. So what we come here today is to ask for continued support. As, as you all know, a residency is, is not something that's inexpensive to start. You know, they say on average about $1.5 million for, you know, the first three years before you can really start seeing any type of, you know, drawback on money. And, you know, what we need is that continued support so we can, you know, pay for our program director and our, you know, associate program director and other faculty members, you know, salaries so we can continue to provide education for, you know, our, our upcoming physicians. Um, you know, if, if you really look at, you know, the area, you know, graduate medical education is really starting to kind of blossom in, in southern Georgia, and I'm very happy to be a part of it, but we need to continue our work on expanding our possibilities. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's really uh, nice to see how the government helps in communities like ours. Thanks to you and thanks to the support that we got last year, we have five young physicians that are training to be internal medicine doctors in a hospital where graduate medical education wasn't wasn't even in the forefront of our thoughts before. So these are young people that hopefully will fill a primary care uh, provider need in our area. But also, I'm a subspecialist in nephrology. I've been in Thomasville close to 27 years, and I find myself providing more and more primary care because of the, the lack of need. But also, there's a lack of subspecialists in this area. So it's been a pleasure for me to see our young training interns who are showing interest in gastroenterology, hematology, and, and nephrology. But I want to thank you for your support and ask that you please consider continuing to support us. Thank you. Thank you both very much. We appreciate it. Next would be um, Amy Lucano and Kelly Ball. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you for allowing us to testify today. And thank you, Tara, for pulling all the data that we needed for today. <laughs> we really appreciate your help. Um, my name's Amy Lowe Cicero. I'm a physical therapist, and this is Kelly Ball. She's a, um, she's a speech pathologist, um, and, we, and, and you know Tom. Uh, <laughs> repre representing the Occupational Therapy Association. Um, we've come here today as CAS providers who've been providing services for children in Georgia, uh, myself for almost 29 years and um, Kelly for 25 years. Um, the past 23 years, I've been a co-owner of All About Kids Therapy Services, providing occupational and physical therapy services to children throughout the state of Georgia diagnosed with delays in their development, including motor delays, cognitive delays, and social emotional delays. For the past 20 years, Kelly has owned um, Therapy Solution of Georgia, providing special uh, speech language and occupational therapy services for children in Gwinnett and Hall County. We are here today on behalf of the American Physical Therapy Association of Georgia, Georgia's Occupational Therapy Association, and Georgia's Speech Language and Hearing Association to request that funds be allocated and to support a rate alignment of the CIS and Babies Can't Wait programs therapy provider rates with the 2022 Physician's Fee or Medicare rates uh, for the Atlanta area. As you might already know, the CMS physicians' rates, Medicare rates, are, compare, um, are based on the cost to provide services to patients. The rates are adjusted each year to account for changes in industry resources required to provide services and are utilized by Medicare in payment of their providers and private insurances when negotiating rates for their providers. 
Currently, the OT and PT CIS codes most frequently used are based on the 2014 Medicare rates uh, for the Atlanta area. Speech codes have not been updated since 2006, and most of the less frequently used codes for PT and OT, like aquatics and wheelchair management, which are still important codes but are less frequently used, have not been updated since 2000. As you know, the past few years we've been uh, see, we've seen inflation rise to over 8% throughout the nation, and Georgia has been no exception. Small practices are struggling to keep up with the rise in rent, the rise in the cost of supplies, the rise in the benefits costs for their employees, and the rise in salaries they're having to pay to keep their providers. Pediatric providers have always struggled to be the competitive, competitive with the practices um, treating primarily adults where Medicare rates and the ability to use assistance to support their patients' treatment plans has supported professional salaries 40 to 50 percent higher than the average pediatric therapist salary. Today, our providers are feeling the squeeze of the economy on their pockets, and they are choosing to leave the practices primarily serving pediatric patients and either switching to treating an adult populated clinics or leaving the profession altogether. Without these providers, we are struggling to keep up with the influx of children with practices reporting over 110, or over 100 children and they're on their waiting list. My practice just in January put 117 kids on the waiting list and I'm in Metro Atlanta. Our governor has generously provided additional funding for teachers and our school systems to help support them as they have also seen significant influx of children with special behavioral needs and delays in, in development. While this funding for schools is greatly needed and most certainly welcomed by all, in order to better prepare our children for the classroom and prevent these emotional and developmental delays, we should also be supporting the programs we have in place that can reach these children and their families prior to the age of five. The CIS program and Babies Can't Wait have the infrastructure to meet the needs, the families, and, the, and prepare the children for school. After all, this is the entire mission of the Early Intervention Program as, de as um, defined by Part C of IDEA. However, since the start of COVID, our state has not been able to adequately meet the needs of these patients where it matters most in their natural environment, in their homes and daycares where they are learning to engage with the world around them and build relationships with those caregivers and peers that will support them as they transition into the school system. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a physical therapist, but, I, but the reason I work in pediatrics is because of the difference I can make in the lives of the families. I've worked in EI for almost 29 years, and while my main goal on a care plan may be to facilitate developmental motor patterns, such as crawling and walking, my secondary goals are to support the caregiver in building a strong relationship with their child and empowering families to be active participants and collaborators in their children's learning. And I'm not unique in this way. In EI, providers are trained to support the families in this way, whether they are a PT, OT, SLP, or, or special instructor. This is our goal. But since COVID, the, the cost of providing services through CIS and Babies Can't Wait programs have been too much for many providers trying to find ways to cut costs. Resources and time and fuel costs spent on travel to homes and daycares, administrative resources spent with tracking down documents required when state funds are being paid, the administrative time spent appealing erroneous denials caused in no part by the provider but glitches in billing portals. These are all challenges that providers by the provider that, that in no part, oops, sorry, um, that providers have decided they are no longer able to commit resources to. This has resulted in providers leaving CMO networks, such as Peach State, that has struggled for two years to fix the same issues with erroneous denials, and Babies Can't Wait, which requires by IDEA Part C to provide services in the natural environment. 
While fewer providers see Medicaid and babies can't wait, seeing babies, um, Medicaid and babies can't wait recipients may save the state in the short term, I would argue that the past few years have shown us what happens when pediatricians, early interventionists, and early childhood educators are not working in sync with one another to support our families. We end up with more children entering the school system that are not ready for school. There's also evidence to support the funding for services and childhood intervention programs like Babies Can't Wait and Early Head Start. Researchers show that the rate of return on your investment is greatest before the child enters the school system at age eight, at age five, sorry. And you have that data there. As I mentioned earlier, the Babies Can't Wait program's primary mission is to prepare children for school. Let me give you an example of how CIS and Babies Can't Wait providers prepare a child with developmental delays for school. Baby Theo arrived for his first therapy session at 22 months of age with um, caregivers' concerns related to decreased attention, difficulty playing with age-appropriate toys, difficult engaging with peers, and poor communication skills. Theo had all the red flags of severe autism. He primarily communicated his needs by tantruming. Daily routines like dressing, brushing teeth, and bathing were a daily battle. When they went out in the community, the parents would have to hold his hand at all times because he would run away without regard for his own safety and would completely disregard any call out by his name. And he had no constructive play skills, one of the most important of the developmental skills since play is how children learn. Today, Theo is a four-year-old and no longer tantrums to communicate with others, but uses signs and gestures and recently is starting to say a few words. He's also playing appropriately with toys and his therapists are confident that he will start school soon with the ability to sit and attend to the teacher and his peers, follow directions, and participate in group activities. Additionally, Theo's parents are now, now empowered with ways to support Theo in his home environment and out in the community, and will be knowledgeable when it's time to transition Theo into the school, where with good collaboration between parents and teachers, Theo should continue to thrive in his school setting. This is just one example of how early intervention can change the course of a child's future at school. Without services, Theo would have entered the school setting without the ability to self-regulate enough to attend to the teacher, follow directions, and engage with his peers. Student and teacher frustration would have inevitably led the behavior to behavioral outbursts and tantruming, which in turn would have led to time spent trying to find ways to prevent Leo from tantruming, or worse yet, Theo would miss class instruction time when sent out of the room or home with his behavior, when his behavior became disruptive to the rest of the classroom. Thank you very much for your presentation today. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Leah Chan. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, my name is Leah Chan, and I'm the Senior Health Analyst at Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the Medicaid unwinding. So <clears throat> time is really running short before the Medicaid unwinding starts on April 1st. And an estimated 545,000 children and adults in Georgia are at risk of losing access to life-saving health care coverage. And this Medicaid unwinding will really put unprecedented uh, pressure on the already overburdened and underpaid eligibility workforce at Department of Human Services. And we feel that it's unrealistic to expect the Department of Human Services staff to be able to meet all the um, needs of Georgians whose Medicaid eligibility is being reprocessed, particularly during the first half of the unwinding when the Department of Human Services will be working on hiring and training over 300 additional new staff while also retaining current staff. So we're calling for additional budget investments that help relieve some of that pressure off 
the Department of Human Services eligibility workers so that they can focus on what they do best. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, our state health agencies worked with trusted messengers and community-based organizations to deliver critical health information about COVID-19 and to really counter vaccine hesitancy. And that's a model we feel like we can build on here. Um, so the state can partner with existing trusted messengers and local community leaders to make sure Georgians know the Medicaid unwinding is coming and help them either stay covered under Medicaid or transition to other forms of coverage. Um, so we're specifically um, calling on state legislators and the governor to pass a budget that includes sub-grants to community-based organizations who can provide that localized education and outreach, disseminate the already um, wonderful developed state covered campaign materials, and in some cases use trained navigators to assist with re-enrollment or transitions to marketplace coverage. Um, these subgrants could also take pressure off eligibility workers by partnering with organizations that already do work with communities in different languages and in different cultural and geographic contexts for the groups of Georgians who are most at risk of losing coverage, like Latinx children, postpartum mothers, and young adults living in rural communities. Um, so for example, these subgrants could go to organizations that support Spanish-speaking communities, organizations that are rooted in rural Southwest Georgia, or organizations that specifically serve pregnant postpartum women. So we know that states like Arkansas um, are already using state funds to partner with community-based organizations to support community outreach and engagement during the Medicaid unwinding. And that funded amount um, needed is small, but the impact has the potential to be great. Um, so we feel like now is the critical time to support Georgians and the hardworking um, state agency employees that serve them. And we feel like with your help, we can avoid massive losses in health care coverage that will harm Georgia's families and ultimately harm our state economy. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Joss Mackey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Josh Mackey presenting on the Georgia EMS, on behalf of the Georgia EMS Association. There's two sheets uh, in your packet relative to what I'm gonna talk about real quick. Um, what we would like to ask the committee to consider is $4.1 million uh, to go into the budget to replace uh, the ambulance license fee that is collected by the state and remitted to the Indigent Care Trust Fund. Uh, ambulance services have paid this fee for approximately 20 years. It was originally set up to work as a provider fee program where the ambulance uh, community would provide the matching funds to the federal government and get them back and enhanced reimbursements. Um, that has never, never actually taken place. So these funds for approximately 20 years have gone into the ICTF and gone to Medicaid in general uh, for indigent care. Um, so the ambulance community, you know, we're asking for this appropriation to basically replace the license fee so that we could eliminate the license fee and return that money back to every ambulance service in the state. Considering the workforce, workforce issues that they face, um, especially, you know, you hear about it from hospitals, doctors, everyone. Um, I think this is one of the most direct ways you could put money back uh, directly with ambulance services to help address that issue. Um, the second page of the sheet is just the most recent fiscal year available um, of the, IG, or the ICTF program. You'll see in this year they actually ran a surplus of funds. Um, that happens, so the way the ICTF works, some years it has a surplus of funds, so it necessarily wouldn't need our fee. Other years it, does, it has a deficit, and so a general appropriation would have to be made to make that up. That hasn't happened for a while, luckily, because the state is doing economically well. Um, but we think this one-time appropriation would, again, make sure that the ICTF is whole so all Georgians are taken care of, and then we can eliminate the fee on ambulance services. Um, in addition, our association is supportive of a general rate increase. Uh, this industry hasn't received one for Medicaid in about six years, and I think um, Gabriel from ACCG is going to talk about that more specifically in a couple presenters. But thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Melody Trimble. Uh, 
Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members and staff. It is good to see you again. I'm Melody Trimble, and I am the CEO of St. Francis Emory Healthcare. And we have been providing services at Emory for over 70 years through public and um, private partnerships. St. Francis is a 376-bed hospital. We have two campuses. Our main campus is located on Manchester, and we also have the Bradley Center, which is an 84-bed psychiatric hospital. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, we started two residency programs. And to date, we have spent about $1.2 million, and we did that without any state appropriation. We felt the need that we needed to do this because that we needed to create access for primary care and mental health services by adding psychiatry services to our um, catchment area. The two programs were uniquely positioned. We have the hospital for the internal medicine program. We also have the Bradley Center where we care for children and seniors alike. So we are 84 beds and capable of doing that. Currently, we have 15 internal medicine residency, and uh, we have 10 uh, additional slots that we are interviewing for now, and I'm happy to report that we have over 140 Georgians who have applied for 10, 10 slots that we have available. If you'll recall, 70% of our residents we had are Georgians currently. Um, on behalf of the board, on behalf of our team members, physicians, and the community, I do want to say thank you for the support that we received in the amended 2023 budget for the internal medicine resident capitation payments and the development of our internal medicine and our psychiatric learning centers. Today, I have just two ask. First is to ensure that we get the capitation payments for the, in, in the 2024 budget for our 25 internal medicine residents and yes, seven psychiatric residents. In addition to that, much like others who have said, we need support financially on uh, faculty recruitment and the cost of the internal medicine and psychiatric residents, faculty and program directors and associate program directors. The, I have provided you a summary of those asks for you as well. Thank you very much. We appreciate your sharing this with us and for what you do. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. Uh -huh. Next will be Stan Jones. I know I look like I was going to say you are not Stan Jones. <laughs> no. Hi, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Helen Slope with Nelson Mullins. And I'm going to try to bumble my way through a couple of requests here for the Georgia Psychological Association that I thought my partner was going to talk to you about today. So um, on behalf of the Georgia Psychological Association, I would like to draw the committee's attention to a couple of things. One is they would like to see Medicaid coverage of diagnostic evaluations that are conducted by psychologists. Presently, um, Medicaid does not cover the CPT code 90791. And so we would like to see that that code be covered so that could, those evaluations could then get proper reimbursement. The second thing I would draw your attention to, hang on here a second, um, is inclusion of um, billing purposes by psychological doctoral interns and post-doctoral residents. Um, under our current um, plan for Medicaid, those two groups of people cannot bill Medicaid. If we were allowing them to actually be able to bill Medicaid, we would expand access to psychological services in the state. These people are very well trained and have a, a lot of experience. Scholastically, they just need to be able to bill for their services that they could perform. And other states do allow for their services. I believe there are two handouts that um, were shared with the committee. And I'd be happy to try to answer some questions or get back to the committee. You, you don't have any questions, thank you. We thank appreciate you so your much. sharing and bringing those to us. Thank you. And our next will be, uh, where is it here? 
Gabriel Carter. Madam Chair and fellow uh, committee members, my name is Gabriel Carter and I'm representing the Association's County Commissioners of Georgia and our organization represents all 159 counties in Georgia. I'm coming to you today because uh, members from all across our 159 counties uh, voted that one of our top legislative priorities for our association this year will be to increase EMS funding. Uh, we are hearing from both rural counties, urban counties, big counties, small counties, that they are struggling to retain workforce, EMTs, paramedics, all workforce associated with uh, EMS, and it is affecting service delivery, and it's also affecting wait times. So uh, we believe that one of the ways we can address this workforce challenge, well, there's three ways that we believe we can address the workforce challenge and uh, challenges with service delivery. The first would be to increase the current Medicaid rate to the rural and urban Medicare rate. Secondly, we wanna change the rules and regulations to include Medicaid reimbursement for the first 10 miles of ambulance transport. Right now it's not included, so uh, essentially, backing uh, the rule change with funding so that the Department of Community Health can make that rule change, having confidence that it's gonna be supported by appropriations. Uh, and lastly, utilizing the ambulance license fees uh, to help address EMS workforce shortages and service delivery challenges, so possibly using the license fees that are collected to help with the funding for some of these requests. Um, I included two documents, so uh, the first is kind of just some background on uh, kind of EMS challenges uh, from the county's perspective, and the second is a document actually produced from the Department of Community Health in January of uh, 2022, and uh, essentially if you just look on the back page, um, we're using that number that they provided to increase the Medicaid rate to the rural and urban Medicare rate. Uh, and it's gonna be about $6 million when adjusted for uh, inflation and some other minor increases. Uh from 2023 to 2024, uh, it's gonna be about $6 million, so we're requesting from this committee to appropriate $6 million on behalf of increasing that uh, Medicaid base rate. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Do we have anyone in the audience that has not spoken? If you came in late, perhaps did not sign up, if you would like to come forward now, please feel free to do so. Okay, I don't see anyone. I will tell you, the one thing that we have heard over and over today is the need for more medical staffing. I think we've seen that and it applies across the entire state. That's something that this committee is looking at and, and frankly the whole legislature is. I'll ask this time if anybody on the committee would like to make a comment. Okay, I appreciate everyone being here and this meeting is adjourned, thank you.